Okay, good. So um, welcome everyone to uh, this next session. We're going to be talking about uh, options for lumpectomy reconstruction, both in the immediate um, uh, time frame and delayed. And because um, although it was uh, mentioned a little bit, there wasn't a specific talk on this um, during the main session. So we thought uh, that we would uh, just give a very brief uh, overview of what lumpectomy reconstruction uh, means and, and what kinds of things we can look after. And then um, we'll be looking forward to your questions, some of which have already been sent in and some of which, or, or most of which hopefully you'll ask. Um, and then we've got our, our panel of uh, experts, our colleagues from Toronto here, um, whose bios I think you can read um, under their names in the on the main page. So um, without uh, spending any more time with that, I'm going to share my screen for a second. I'm assuming everyone can hear me and can see this. Okay. Um, okay, so um, when we're talking about lumpectomy reconstruction, the reality is uh, most lumpectomies do not require any reconstruction. This is a very common way to look after breast cancer. And like you see in the two examples, these are two different patients that have had lumpectomies and there's really no deformity. They can go on to have their treatment and don't require anything else. That's probably 80% of patients. So, uh, so that's a standard lumpectomy. That's about 80% you know, of, of cases. In 20 to 30% of cases where the tumor is large or in a sensitive location or the breast is small, we want to avoid a deformity like you can see here, uh, which would occur if you did a standard lumpectomy. And so we can do that. This is a very complicated drawing. You don't need to memorize this, of course, but uh, we can do this by moving some of the adjacent breast tissue around and doing something that looks like a breast lift or a breast reduction and going from the photo on the left to having a lumpectomy and basically a breast reduction, uh, which is the photo on the right. And then again, the tumor is removed and there's no uh, deformity like the one that you saw could happen without the reduction. The second uh, way to do this is with tissue replacement. So the first one is rearrangement of tissue. If there's enough tissue in a small breast um, or a large tumor where there's not enough tissue to move around, we need to take tissue from somewhere else in the body. Uh, oftentimes that's from an adjacent area like the side of the chest, which is the picture that you see here. And then you can see the top frame frames are the patient um, before the lumpectomy and the bottom frames after lumpectomy with this type of tissue replacement reconstruction and then radiation and there's no uh, deformity there. Uh, so those are when done immediate, which means the, the reconstruction is done at the same time as the lumpectomy. Probably many um, of you listening and many patients that have had lumpectomies didn't have this opportunity and now have had a lumpectomy and have a deformity, uh, small or large, uh, that can look something like one of these photos. And so there are a few ways that we can address that um, on an elective basis. Um, for a small deformity, uh, fat grafting was talked a lot about during the main session, so I won't spend a lot of time, but basically we take a little bit of fat from somewhere else and inject it into the area to help with the deformity. This would be an example of this with the deformity on the left and the repair on the right. Uh, again, tissue rearrangement means moving the breast tissue around to reconstruct the area of deformity. And this would look like a breast reduction um, to fill in that uh, lumpectomy deformity. And then finally, tissue replacement, similar to in the immediate situation, if the breast is very small, there's not enough tissue left, then we bring tissue from somewhere else often the back or the side of the chest, or maybe the abdomen to fill in uh, the deformity. So, so really that's an overview. Again, um, lump, most lumpectomies do not require any kind of uh, reconstruction, but um, those that uh, are large tumors or small breasts that may result in a, in a deformity um, should consult with or should have as part of their consultation a plastic surgeon um, to discuss how to avoid um, these kinds of deformities and for patients that already have a deformity, then um, there are multiple options uh, for uh, repair or reconstruction. Uh, Stefan, if you want to talk about how do how does a patient know if, if they're supposed to have a lumpectomy, how do they know if they need to see a plastic surgeon or they do they just go ahead and you know have their lumpectomy? Um, how does how do they or, how do you organize things in your hospital or how can a patient know if they need to see somebody? Yeah, I think uh, 
I think it's important to realize for patients, but it's kind of hard to know if nobody tells you that actually your breast surgeon has to be open to the idea that the plastic surgeon is involved to make it better. And uh, I, I guess you're lucky if you're in an environment where that exists. If, if you're not in an environment where that exists, you have to work with your breast surgeon. So I've been doing this for a very long time. So out of Princess Margaret and Toronto General, we have a, a really very proactive group of breast surgeons who don't need reminding and they actually will consider that, uh, this for every patient that they, uh, that they talk to. Uh, I think if you're listening and this is something that you're gonna have uh, coming towards you, you should, uh, if it's not being offered proactively, ask your breast surgeon uh, to be referred to a plastic surgeon. It never hurts to have a, an opinion of a plastic surgeon. Uh, the worst thing that can happen is uh, that the plastic surgeon will, or it's actually a good thing, that the plastic surgeon will say, you actually don't need it. Um, but especially if it's a larger lump uh, in any breast or if it's a, a normal lump in a smaller breast, you should be uh, talking to your breast surgeon and, and ask for a referral. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have anything to add, um, Dr. Snell, anything at, at Sunnybrook? I mean, I think we have a little bit of an advantage in, in this group in that I think we discuss almost every breast cancer case at some form of rounds. And so patients are identified as maybe needing um, something more from a plastic surgeon, even if they're a lumpectomy patient, but that's not the case in many hospitals. So do you have any insight into any additional insight into um, how a patient can avail themselves of a plastic surgeon or, or know if they need one? Questions that a patient might ask. Well, I think that it's important to know also that the breast, you know, different breast surgeons have different comfort levels with respect to the size of lumpectomy that they're comfortable with managing and potentially the size of lumpectomy that they're not comfortable managing and when they may um, wish to have a plastic surgeon's input or assistance. And like you said, Ron, we're very fortunate in the way that our uh, programs are set up because we're very much integrated into the cancer center. And we often see all the patients together and it's not necessarily as easy or organized in that way at all centers. So, you know, it's worth maybe just bringing up with the breast surgeon and just say, you know, um, with the size of the defect that you anticipate that I have, what do you think that my lumpectomy scars going to look like? What do you think my symmetry will be like? Um, do you think that there would be any benefit to discussing with this with a plastic surgeon at this point? So you could open the dialogue. I think most breast surgeons now especially would be open to talking about it. Um, and uh, that would just start the conversation at least so that you know that they know that you're thinking about that and that you know that if it's needed, you would be open and willing to seeing a plastic surgeon. Okay. Um, can we can we talk a little bit about um, immediate versus um, delayed? So that was there was a lot of talk about that in the main session, mostly with regards to mastectomy. Um, for lumpectomy, um, do you feel that it's this is the same uh, same discussion? In other words, with mastectomy, it's pretty clear now that if we can talk to a patient before a mastectomy and talk about options for immediate reconstruction, that's ideal. Um, does the same need to be done with a lumpectomy or are these things that are easily repaired after the fact? Thomas, do you want to? Sure. Uh, I think there's um, first and foremost, uh, the oncologic aspects of the cancer treatment is uh, number one. And then we as plastic surgeons uh, can step in after that. Uh, in the immediate setting versus the delayed setting, I think there has to be a conversation as well with the oncology team. Um, who might choose to refer at this time or later. But if the referral is uh, an earlier one and there is an opportunity and an indication for a delayed uh, reconstruction, uh, you mentioned mastectomies, but in the setting of a, a lumpectomy defect, I think the pros and cons have to be weighed. And the most important one is the oncologic one. And then afterwards, if there's the ability to speak to the patients about doing something immediately, then we can speak to them in the context of the plastic surgeries that, or plastic surgery or plastic surgeries that might be required and the timing of them. Uh, of course, if there's any, if the patients are a bit higher risk and there's a bit of a doubt about the margins or what's gonna happen oncologically, uh, it might be better to consider 
uh, getting that sorted out first and considering a more delayed approach to reconstruction. Um, Ron, with some of the photos that you showed in the presentation, uh, there are some defects that can be closed very well right away and there isn't an ensuing deformity, only the scar is visible and maybe some radiation changes. Uh, but also uh, later on, some of the smaller defects can be uh, reconstructed just as well in delayed fashion versus comparing to a mastectomy, which is not the, the scope of this session, where uh, patients might go obviously flat or have an in ensuing deformity uh, if that's not addressed in the immediate setting when it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so I think, you know, as apropos to that, you know, there are, there are always pros and cons and things that patients should um, consider. You know, one of the things that may be a, a bit more unique to a lumpectomy is the concept of a positive margin, right? So that, of course, can happen with a mastectomy as well. And that's where uh, some of the tumor uh, may be left behind. And that's something we, we only know after the final pathology comes back. Um, in a lumpectomy, because only the tumor itself and a little bit of surrounding breast tissue is removed, uh, there is always the chance of there being a positive margin or having some tumor left behind, which we find out two weeks later. Um, and so I, I think if we can have a, a little discussion about you know, what we tell patients about that in a normal lumpectomy versus maybe if we do a more complicated tissue rearrangement and what that might mean for the patient. So. I think we probably all have experience with that. Dr. Hoffer, do you want to just enlighten us on the difference between positive margin and an oncoplastic versus a, a regular lumpectomy? Um, yeah, I, I guess I think that uh, any patients where there's a slightest consideration of a, an oncoplastic approach to a reconstructed breast or, or a reconstruction, any patient would benefit from speaking to the plastic surgeon beforehand, even if it is not a good idea to do an immediate reconstruction, to at least have that peace of mind that we all thought about it and that the options were laid out. And uh, some people have a situation where an immediate reconstruction may be a bit risky because of a positive margin, uh, but some people proactively want to try the reconstruction, even if there's a likelihood that there may be a positive margin or that there may follow radiation. And other people, if they, don't, if they just hear that there may be this option, they will say, oh, well, let's deal with this first and do a delayed reconstruction. But everybody should get the opportunity to have a, a good conversation and, and make their own mind up uh, what they want. So I, I think it's, it's really important uh, to, to have a conversation before and not afterwards, because uh, afterwards, sometimes uh, some of the options are not, no longer available and some way bigger uh, procedures uh, are necessary. So um, and I think if you work in, like most of us have a very knowledgeable breast surgeons, if you work in a team where they're not, the breast surgeon knows uh, what the breast size and the lumpectomy kind of is going to be, then they will not send every patient to us because they will know that they have a good outcome. And if they have a positive margin and need another lumpectomy, then they will approach us. But as soon as it gets sketchy, whether this first lumpectomy, whether it's clear or not, is going to leave a, a normal looking breast, uh, I think we should be involved uh, to educate the patient and then the patient can make an educated decision. Okay, um, I'm gonna um, selflessly go away from my list of questions to um, a couple of questions that have come in. So one is um, a patient that was diagnosed with breast cancer, had surgery and radiation, and then uh, developed a hematoma and had a lumpectomy to remove it. This is about a year and a half ago. Really the question is, um, if there is now a, a large deformity uh, where the, the bottom part of the breast, you know, below the nipple is really missing, uh, what might be options for that? So that's um, sort of the, the delayed lumpectomy reconstruction. The fact that there was a complication um, may add something, but, um, what might some of the options be? And she's specifically asking if it's large, can you have a Dieppe or a, or a tram flap to reconstruct part of the breast? So uh, Dr. Snell, do you do that? Uh, so do I do a tram to reconstruct part of the breast? Typically not. I There's other options, um, but I would have to see the patient first. So usually when I see patients with a delayed 
um, defect or delayed lumpectomy defect, I really try to have a long conversation about what their goals and priorities are. So is it symmetry? Is it nipple position? Is it tethering? You know, what are the priorities? And then we, we sort of try to make a plan as to how to best achieve those goals with the least amount of surgery typically is what most patients want. Um, there are options, for example, like you showed in your pictures, Ron, if the defect is small, you can do fat grafting or scar releases. If the defect is larger, however, and if the defect includes both volume of breast and skin or covering of the breast, then typically you would need to add in tissue, but I would usually use tissue from the back first. So the latissimus flap to rotate anteriorly before I would use something like a free flap or, or a tram flap to do a partial breast reconstruction. Um, that would be sort of my approach, again, generalizing and not seeing the specifics of this particular patient. Okay, and and um, the um, that the, this person also asking because they've had a lumpectomy and radiation, which is the standard uh, for breast conserving therapy, um, is there a greater problem uh, with the delayed reconstruction in terms of infection or uh, issues related to flap survival and things like that? And I know some of this was dealt with in the general session, but um, uh, Dr. Constantine, do you want to just, just kind of overview? Are we worried about reconstruction in a previously radiated breast? Sure. We, we worry as plastic surgeons uh, because we a lot of the work we do, a lot of the reconstruction in this particular case, this sounds like it would be uh, probably more of a, uh, a tissue replacement than a tissue rearrangement from what you described earlier, Ron. That's kind of where I think it's going. And the blood supply is, is affected by several things, uh, surgery, but especially radiation as well. Uh, the um, controlled injury that radiation produces to help the oncologic outcomes also has an effect on the adjacent normal tissue. And one of those effects is to increase the amount of scarring, cause tissue changes and decrease the blood supply uh, locally. Uh, so the option of bringing in some tissue from elsewhere, uh, which hasn't seen radiation, uh, that is uh, healthier, like uh, that would be uh, something to consider. And also um, in releasing, for example, some tissue in the lower pole of the breast, uh, that will create more space that will allow the rest of the breast to uh, have less of a contracture there. And at that point, um, if you plan uh, your surgery accordingly, you might want to bring in a little bit more tissue than what is just obviously visible so that it would match a little bit more uh, uh, the contralateral or the, the normal breast if, if it is indeed normal. Um, and um, to help improve some of the, uh, the local blood supply in the area as well. Because once you remove some tissue to reconstruct, you're removing some of the radiation injury that's in that tissue, but not completely. And by providing some um, new tissue there, uh, you can help the remaining, of, the remaining of the surgical bed to heal as well, uh, long-term, not just uh, as, as the, uh, the surgery happens. Okay, so, so really, and I, I'm going to, um, sort of uh, summarize that again, just because a, another person asked, it's a, it's a more complicated question about being postpartum and, um, and then um, uh, having to have uh, a lumpectomy, but wanting potentially to wait for any kind of reconstruction until uh, later um, after radiation. So I think like the, the overall summary is of, of course, radiation does cause um, damage to the tissues, which does affect how things heal and, and maybe some of the options for reconstruction. But, you know, our job, you know, or our best tool is to bring healthy um, tissues into that area, whether it's, um, and, and this was talked about in the main session, it's a pedicled flap, or it's a free flap, or it's, you know, rotating um, some skin from nearby, um, or even in some cases, you know, fat grafting or fat injection. Um, but the idea is to bring something healthy that will help with the deformity and also help with any of the damage from, from radiation. Um, let me just see if there's another. Um, so, um, so somebody is asking, um, uh, she, had a, uh, she had a lumpectomy and radiation, but still has a seroma. Um, would a new surgery get rid of the seroma and how long would you have to wait to see a plastic surgeon? So she finished radiation in mid-July. Um, surgery, surgery was end of April and radiation was 
end of July. So um, let's make that a little bit more general. So somebody has a has breast conserving therapy. Um, when would the ideal time to see that patient to see that the defect has settled and it's kind of where it's going to be? And now maybe we should consider reconstruction. What what do we think an ideal time for that? Is it immediately? Is it six months, a year later? Um, Dr. Hoffer? Yeah, I guess that's a short answer. I mean, everybody probably has a different uh, timeline. I would see the patient at, uh, probably at three or four months, and then I uh, would not operate before six months after the last radiation has finished. Um, I also want to just a short comment just on the, on the previous uh, question, because if someone has a lumpectomy, and I think that's important to kind of think about if you have had a lumpectomy and like this lady who is missing like her entire lower pole or a lot of tissue there, what I generally talk to uh, with my patient is because I don't like doing a large partial reconstruction because there's a lot of breast tissue still in that breast and radiated and you're kind of adding good tissue to bad tissue. So I always discuss with the patient, why don't you remove the remainder of your breast tissue because after lumpectomy, there's a higher chance of local recurrence than after mastectomy. Why don't you remove all the breast tissue there is and then do a full, like a full reconstruction with your own tissue and the entire breast will feel better uh, and you have a lower chance of getting a local recurrence. So I think that's also important. Uh... Yeah, I th yeah, I think that's, that's extremely important and it's something that, that patients don't think about uh, and probably a lot of surgeons, you know, general surgeons and plastic surgeons uh, don't necessarily think about. So if it is a large deformity and there's still breast tissue remaining, this patient needs to be monitored constantly, has that slightly increased risk of recurrence. And sometimes full reconstruction, you know, is, is better and easier for, for the reasons you mentioned. Um, I guess an, another uh, along those same lines is the idea of reconstruction on the opposite side to help with whatever the imbalance or deformity is. I mean, I think we all see patients who don't necessarily have what we keep talking about as a deformity, like a divot or something that's, that's uh, tethered, but maybe had a large lumpectomy and the breast is just smaller. And so patients and we often think, how can we make this breast bigger? But sometimes it's easier to make the, the contralateral, the other breast smaller and just restore balance in that way, not have, and then you don't have to operate on a breast that's already had surgery and radiation, um, et cetera. So, you know, for all those reasons, it, you know, if there's something after a lumpectomy or you anticipate something with a lumpectomy that is going to be imbalanced or there is going to be a deformity or um, something that's going to bother you, that, that's why the conversation with a plastic surgeon is probably um, a good idea. Um, let me just say, um, I just throw it out to the to the panel for a minute. Um, things that come up, you know, from patients um, that that you wish they would have asked earlier. I mean, I hear all the time patients, you know, after lumpectomy say, "Well, I wish I had asked this, you know, prior to my lumpectomy," or, um, or "I wish I had asked something to a plastic surgeon." Do you have any um, advice or things that patients should think about when they're trying to make these decisions? Um, Can I? Uh, oh, sorry. Dr. Snell, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I, just, I was just going to say sort of back to the timing thing, and maybe it kind of relates also on to what you just said, but sometimes you have patients that end up with a lumpectomy and then potentially a repeat lumpectomy, and they end up with a larger than anticipated um, tissue deficiency or defect um, that we as, as plastic surgeons may have the opportunity to reconstruct prior to radiation starting because sometimes it's easier to do, for example, a local flap from the lateral chest wall to fill in a defect in the lateral aspect of the breast before the radiation starts. And then you can radiate it once the tissue is already in place. And that may be a better option for those particular patients rather than doing the reconstruction after radiation starts. So that sometimes is an opportunity if patients um, potentially ended up with a larger um, lumpectomy than the general surgeon was anticipating, or they ended up having to have repeat lumpectomies because of positive margins and have ended up with a deformity, potentially quickly seeing a plastic 
plastic surgeon prior to the, um, the beginning of radiation may be a good option as well for timing. Um, so that would be sort of in that category of maybe what I wish I might have asked is there is potentially an opportunity to intervene with reconstruction um, in between the lumpectomy and the radiation beginning. I would have maybe um, two things, one that's more kind of general and one that's a bit more specific to answer that question. I know we spoke a little bit about uh, access to seeing a plastic surgeon and it is broad day, so raising awareness is important. Uh, but all of us practice uh, in a big city, the GTA, there's a lot of general surgeons, there's a lot of plastic surgeons, and there's a lot of very good cancer centers. But that's not the case for everybody necessarily listening in tonight. Not everybody necessarily has the same access. So it might be easier for us to just go down the hall and speak to a general surgeon and vice versa. But that might not be as possible or as easy if you live further away. Uh, one of the things that I would say, though, is uh, that's more general, but more specific. Um, in my center at Humber, we have relatively early referrals. So I and my colleagues have the opportunity to see people quite early after their breast cancer diagnosis when it's appropriate. And I can't really say that I've had uh, people that have said, oh, um, this time that I had uh, and I saw a plastic surgeon quickly, that, that was a waste of time, that that wasn't useful, I learned nothing. I was very busy with my cancer diagnosis and this was a total waste of time. It's more the opposite. They wish they would have had a bit more information in the early phases at least at the very least to be able to choose between immediate and delayed reconstructions if, if that's possible, instead of going straight to, to delayed, which might be a missed opportunity or not. And the, it depends on um, the patient and the oncologic status. But more specifically, a, uh, a question that sometimes arises in consultation, some of the general surgeons will give patients multiple options for managing their tumor. And sometimes one option is lumpectomy with radiation. And another option is to do a full mastectomy, like Dr. Hofer was saying, and then with less chance of radiation or very unlikely uh, occurrence of radiation. And some patients weigh that and they're not sure how to decide. They have to make a decision fairly quickly because the tumor has to come out one way or another. But in the interim, they see someone like me and they might ask me, the general surgeon gave me this option for tumor removal. These are my, my surgical oncologic options. What do you suggest? Like what would a lumpectomy reconstruction look like if the, you know, it's about this big and what options do you have to offer if it's uh, the whole breast, including maybe even the other one prophylactically if it's appropriate. And that's an interesting conversation to have because even though the breast cancer is not good news, knowing your options can be positive. And if you're gonna pick something, sometimes it's really good to know what you're not picking so that you have a better ability to make a decision. And if later on you're faced with, for example, you know, a lumpectomy, a repeat lumpectomy, which eventually might become a mastectomy, maybe you understand at each point in the treatment why you made a certain decision as opposed to thinking, okay, the breast cancer happened to me and then this treatment happened to me. So for a lot of patients, that's actually uh, a good thing in an early consultation. And it's a good question to ask when it's appropriate oncologically. Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely true. Um, I think again, if I could su summarize for everyone that's listening, um, timing is, is everything. Um, it, but it's different depending on what the, the issue is, right? So if, if we wanna get something done before radiation, then it becomes something that's fairly urgent. If a patient's already had radiation, then we extend things out as we heard six months, uh, even to a year, which is, which is usually how long I'll, I will wait. Um, and, uh, but the earlier that you can uh, have a conversation with a plastic surgeon, the earlier you can make the decisions along the way. Um, as Dr. Constantine said. So, um, you know, it's, it is, and that's what the whole day is about, really. It's about, you know, patients advocating really um, for themselves. And, you know, it starts with the general surgeon. They're the ones making the, the um, diagnosis. But, you know, asking, you know, do, do I need to, or should I, or I would like to speak to a plastic surgeon so that, you know, all of the pieces in the puzzle are, are there as early as possible. Um, on, on that note, um, th this is like one of those really obvious things, but I hear it from patients all the time. How do patients get to see a plastic surgeon? So we can just go around what, you know, I mean, the obvious is the general surgeon calls you and says, I need you to see this patient, but that doesn't always happen. If it's coming from a patient, how do they get to see one of us? 
I mean, we get referrals as you all do from anybody along their treatment pathway at any time. So we get referrals from the radiation oncologist, from the medical oncologist, from the family doctor, um, really from anybody in their circle of care. Uh, we would accept referrals from, at Sunnybrook at least, uh, the referral usually has to come with some, from somebody who works at Sunnybrook or part of the treatment has been at Sunnybrook. Um, but, uh, it, you know, that's obviously, you know, at other centers, that may not be the policy, I guess. Um, but typically it just requires a referral from a physician, any physician. Okay. And, um, and I know, I mean, probably this happens to everyone, but, you know, we do get patients that call, you know, and ask, um, you know, there's probably a plastic surgeon in your community if it's not at a big center. Um, and it doesn't hurt to call that plastic surgeon's office and say, does that, does the surgeon do, you know, breast cancer reconstruction? Um, you will need a referral, of course, as we just said, um, but to do a little bit of, you know, research on your own, if maybe your family doctor, if that's the stage you're at, or if the general surgeon it doesn't have a, a close connection with a plastic surgeon, then you can always ask. And if that surgeon does that kind of work, then somebody needs to get a referral, you know, to that office and, and they'll see you. Um, I'm going to yeah. jump over to a question that just came up. I just, sort no. Of talk about no, I just want to say that I agree with what's been said, but uh, yeah, we typically see anybody who we get a lot of patients who call us directly or who call uh, or who email us and they're from like all over Ontario and we just ask who's your GP uh, send us your notes and then uh, we see them it doesn't matter where they come from uh, if, if the surgeon needs to see them first you call the surgeon and say can you bring this patient in patients who come from far we see the same day uh, patients who come from within the GTA if you can see we see them the same day but otherwise the same week so we uh I guess this is pretty much all we do. So we have a, we do a lot of this. So we have a, a very kind of smooth system. Yeah, I, th I think that's an important point is that um, generally large centers will see patients, happy to see patients from all over. So it's yeah. not always in your community. Um, so, so reach out to, you know, a nearby center for sure. Um, let, I just want to make sure we do get to all the questions. This, this, um, person is, say, is asking, I had my lumpectomy in the right breast one year ago and then radiation five months ago. The right breast is a bit smaller than the left breast. If I get fat grafting done, does it stay in the breast a long time or do I need to go in later and have it redone? I'm happy with the lumpectomy, but seeing if fat grafting will help even out the size of the breast since there's really just a size uh, mismatch. We sort of touched on that, but um, Dr. Snell, what, what's your approach to good shape, but size mismatch? I usually prefer to do whatever I can to avoid operating on the radiated side. So if there is a size mismatch, um, but the contour of the lumpectomy side is okay, then typically my approach is to try to balance the other side. So reduce the other side to make it more similar to the lumpectomy side. Um, that of course, isn't what some patients want. And then we would change the plan if that's not what they want, but, um, that's usually what I prefer to do if possible, because in terms of risk profile, so risk of complications, it's usually, um, lower if you re really don't do much on the radiated tissue side. Does anybody have any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I think I it's would, pretty common. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, usually to people don't understand that if, if your breast is being radiated radiated is like a like a big burn it's radioactivity burns your skin and your tissue so everything shrinks so you're lucky if your shape is still nice but the entire breast mount has kind of shrunk a little bit so typically it's not just that there's not enough volume there's also not enough skin uh, so just adding fat will make your breast maybe a bit perkier or bigger uh, but then it's not the same breast on the other, as on the other side because the skin is tighter. And that said, I don't like Dr. Snell, I don't like lipofilling radiated tissues because it's very unpredictable. Typically that fat does not stay. It looks great in the beginning or great. It looks fuller in the beginning, but it, it'll, in my experience, it uh, disappears. And uh, then you can try and redo it once or twice or three times. 
but typically it doesn't stay. So I, I would agree with Dr. Snell's approach to try something on the other side or accept it if it's just a very small difference before getting in, into all kinds of surgeries. But this is a patient, you, you'd need to see it to be, be able to kind of give like a real good advice. Yeah, and I, and I think if I can say at least, you know, from my experience, although I learned everything I know from the rest of this panel, but anyways, um, the, um, the reality is besides the radiation, we tend not to use fat graft. And I know uh, Dr. Brown talked about this in the main session. You know, we tend not to use fat grafting really for volume. Like if there's really a size difference, then fat grafting probably not the bag. Sometimes is an option, but it's usually not the first option. It's really for improving contour or, or filling a deformity or something smaller. Um, so that's as a general um, as a general rule. And then of course, with the radiation, all of the things that Dr. Hoffer uh, brought up. So uh, certainly considering what can be done on the other non-radiated, non-operated side um, is, is often easier and, and can provide a very nice uh, balanced um, uh, result. Um, somebody asked a question, I had it written down and it's a very important question. I'm so glad they asked. Um, does OHIP cover the entire cost of reconstruction? Uh, yes, yes, OHIP does cover the cost of reconstruction. Now, if, you know, if it's for balancing, of course, it's covered. If it's for contour deformities, if it's to improve breast appearance related to the breast cancer treatment, it does cover. It doesn't cover for, you know, if you wish to have a general augmentation on both sides of the breast, um, that wouldn't be covered. But if it's related to symmetry or trying to uh, decrease a defect from the breast cancer treatment, yes, it is covered. What a lot of people might not realize is uh, things are covered now, but that wasn't always the case. There were many years where um, even if you had access to some of this care, uh, you ne didn't necessarily have uh, OHIP or uh, whichever health uh, jurisdiction you're, you're in in, uh, in Canada. They didn't necessarily cover things the, the way they do now and not with the same breadth of, uh, uh, of coverage, including on the other side, on the, on the normal side as a balancing procedure. So now I think uh, breast cancer patients that are reconstruction patients have a lot more options uh, and uh, not just in terms of surgically, but what, what's covered. Uh, and that's a very nice option to have. Yeah, I would agree with that. There's another question. It, it's, this is, it's much nicer being the moderator, so I don't have to answer the, these questions. It, they're very hard without seeing um, the, the patients, of course, but. Um, this is a patient that had bilateral breast cancer um, and uh, bilateral uh, radiation, chemotherapy, but bilateral radiation. And now there's a difference in nipple height of at least uh, a centimeter, or sorry, an inch and a half uh, difference in, in nipple position. Um, is there something that can be done about that? We sort of talked a little bit about it, but um, Dr. Hoffer. Yeah, I think there's probably very likely something that can be done, but you'd have to see it. Uh, I mean, if it's if the breasts are exactly the same size and everything is exactly the same, and there was more radiation just above the nipple, which caused that to go up, then it would be difficult, especially if it's in a, in an unnatural position. If it's in a natural position, then you could do something with a lift or a little reduction. But if sometimes in lumpectomies, lumpectomies you see that the nipple is really pulled towards the side or up or down that is more difficult to correct. Uh, that's not so simple. And you, like you say, you'd have to see the patient. But uh, if they're in a, in a more or less normal position, then something should be possible. That's far easier to raise a nipple than lower a nipple. Yes. Yeah. If not impossible. Yes. To lower it. <laughs> exactly, unless you add in tissue and have a skin paddle or yeah. something. But yeah, it's, it's really hard. Um. So, and, I, and I, as I was just listening to that, I was thinking to myself, so just so that patients understand a little bit about what a consultation with a plastic surgeon is like, if you haven't um, had that opportunity, it's very hard to get a plastic surgeon to tell you that there's nothing you can do. So there is, there, so there may, it may be complicated or it may be easy, but you know, I think our collectively, our job is to figure out how to improve uh, something that, that isn't ideal. 
um, and there's almost always some solution. It may not be the right solution for the patient, um, and uh, you know, uh, so that's wh where most of the discussion is. But um, I think for almost any question that a patient could ask, the answer would be there's something that can be done. We would need to see and and discuss. Um, are there any other questions? We just have a couple, literally a couple more minutes. Um, questions from the panel that, that or things that, sorry, that you think are important for patients to know about lumpectomy reconstruction? Sorry, we, we only have like one more minute left. So one more question. One more question, okay. Somebody teach us something that patients should know about lumpectomy reconstruction. <laughs> I think it's just really important to advocate for yourself as a patient. If you want something and you don't get a clear answer, be persistent. Because uh, in all the studies, you always see that patients who are like, better educated, who are more persistent, uh, get better care. So don't kind of sit back and wait and, and think someone else is going to solve it for you. Just just be proactive together with your family and your, your whoever's supporting you. Be proactive. Yeah, I think that's very true. Sometimes I have some patients who actually come to the clinic with papers, like research articles from the plastic surgery literature. It happens sometimes. And even though we might not do at all what uh, it says in that article, because it might not be appropriate to them, the fact that they go that far to get information, not just by attending events like this, but by you know, reading a lot of things, including what we read, I think is very good. Because if you understand more what's going on with yourself, you're going to recover better, as Dr. Hofer says and uh, you'll be uh, in, in better shape overall to make decisions for yourself. Amazing. Okay, well, I, I thank you uh, so much uh, to the panel um, for, for all of the valuable uh, answers and advice. Hopefully that was um, helpful. We had a whole lot of people involved and with questions and everything. So um, I, again, to, to echo everyone's sentiment, please get in touch with a plastic surgeon um, so that you can continue your discussion if, if it's appropriate and um, enjoy the rest of um, Broad Day. Thank you all.